Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 33. Ahmad, that's the Old Testament. Isaiah 33. I have to help those folks out that don't know where their Bible is. Isaiah 33. We're going to look at verses 15 through 17 tonight. I mentioned last Sunday night from inside of that box up there on the wall that uh, we're going to start looking for several weeks at this matter of uh, our work for the Lord. We began a bit last week, just a bit of a foundation, and I want to talk to you tonight, continue that thought. God has us here for a purpose. God created you for a purpose, and God saved you for a purpose. And our purpose is not serving ourselves. Our purpose is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And this evening, as you turn there to Isaiah 33, I want you to look at these uh, just three verses with us as we uh, a bit of a, a jumping off point. And, and very much like last week, I'm going to give you some references to write down, some verses uh, that I hope you'll look up and spend some time studying out in the uh, week and weeks to come. But Isaiah 33, verse 15 he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from the hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Let's uh, pray together here. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, as we endeavor, Lord, to find our purpose, to fill our purpose. Lord, to excel in this matter of serving you. Lord, how sad it is that you have a purpose for us, and Lord, so often we fail to fulfill it. Lord, I ask you to encourage our hearts tonight as we look in your word together. Lord, I pray that uh, we would see what you have for us. Lord, I pray that we would desire to honor you. Lord, I pray that we would realize that there is a difference and there ought to be a difference between your children, between your people and those of the world. And Lord, tonight we want to live for you. We want to honor you. Lord, we, we want to be what you desire us to be as a Christian. And Lord, I pray that we would come to that place in our heart tonight. Lord, we would see that we have some privileges. And Lord, how privileged we are to have you as our Heavenly Father. Lord, would you just work in us and through us tonight. Lord, help me. Lord, to teach you right your truth. Bless us now as we work together, as we seek together, as we seek your will and your purpose. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We won't read the entire chapter of Isaiah 33, but I encourage you to do so as you study out and, and see what God has for us. We see here and in many places in Scripture, a picture of some things that God wants for us as a believer. How many of you have ever seen a moose? How many of you have never seen a moose in person? How many of you remember the first time you saw a moose? I remember the very first time I saw a moose. I grew up in West Virginia. We don't have moose where I'm from. Uh, they, they don't exist we have deer, we have turkeys, uh, we have uh, squirrels and rabbits and possums. If you're highfalutin, you say opossums, but I'm not. We just call them possums. 
Uh, we got groundhogs. We got lots of critters, but we don't have moose. I went with a group of men up to Temiskaming, Quebec, and I'm probably not saying that right, but that's okay. Uh, Temiskaming, Quebec is just across the border from Ontario into Quebec and a logging community. And I went with a group of men just a, a couple of weeks, maybe a month before we came to Canada in June of uh, 2005. And I went there, on a, the fellas took me on a hunting trip, bear hunting. The only thing that I got was bitten by mosquitoes. I didn't get any bears. I didn't get anything. I did catch a few fish, but uh, I looked like I had some kind of disease. My face was swollen up with mosquito bites and black fly bites and noceum bites. Uh, I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital. But the very first day we got there, so we're driving in down this logging road in Temiskaming, Quebec. I was riding with a friend of mine, and Mike Sayers, his name. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of the logging road was a big bull moose, and I mean a big moose. And Mike stopped the truck, and I don't know why I did it. I jumped out of the truck, and I started chasing that moose. I don't know why. I just it was like a dog chasing a car. Why does a dog chase a car? What's it going to do with it? Uh, I'm trying to say I have the mentality of a dog. And I'm chasing this moose. I always want to get close to it. I wanted to see it. I'd never seen one before. But imagine, if you will, somebody had never seen a moose, never even seen a picture of a moose, had no idea what a moose looked like, and you try to describe to them what a moose looked like. Josh shot a moose yesterday, and they're big. They're kind of ugly. They're funny looking. But if somebody came up to Brother Friesen and said, hey, what's a moose look like? He'd try to, well, <laughs> kind of like a horse, but different, uh, kind of stupid looking. Uh, kind of has this thing hanging off of him. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't do anything. Uh, it's got this kind of hump on its back. Uh, it's got this big, long face with a big nose. And when he got done, people would say, oh, you mean like Pastor Rice? And he'd say, yeah, a little bit like Pastor Rice. Well, if you try to describe what a moose looked like, you, you'd give some, some descriptive terms. In the Word of God, God gives some very descriptive terms about what a Christian ought to be, about what we, how we ought to live, if you will, some definitions. And, and I won't take time to go back here in this full passage. We're going to look at a couple other things in a moment. Uh, but five things that we see in this passage about a Christian, uh, we walk uprightly. That, that's, uh, now, a moose doesn't walk uprightly. A moose walks on all fours. If I saw a moose walking uprightly, I'd be scared to death. He'd be 15 feet tall walking around through the, through the bush. But this walking uprightly speaks of walking rightly before the Lord. Uh, we speak uprightly. We walk righteously. Uh, we see another picture here, uh, despising the gain. Despising, look if you will, uh, verse 15, despising the gain of oppressions. Notice something else here. He shaketh, shaketh his hands from holding the bribes. In other words, hey, I want nothing to do with that. Now, what we have here in this verse and in this passage is a picture, a description of a Christian, uh, of a, what we see as a New Testament believer uh, later on in the Word of God. Uh, we see as well here, stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. Number six, there in that verse, shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Now, if we just look at that verse and we just look at those descriptions, if we try to quantify ourselves and see ourselves fitting into that box, we have to ask ourselves the question, how do I fit? Do I walk righteously? Do I speak honestly? Am I slow to hear evil, careful about what I see? Being a Christian, a true believer, touches our whole life. From, from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, or the top of your hair, if you have hair. I don't have hair, so just the top of my head, it stops there. It touches all of our life. It, it, it ta it's to saturate every bit of us. It, there's no part of us that is excluded uh, from God's work when we come to Christ. God changes us and touches every aspect of us. Write down... Uh, Romans 6, verse 13. 
I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but write that down. Also write down the reference, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, as you look at those verses later, you're going to see what it means, if you will, to be a Christian, to, to look like, act like, be what God wants us to be. In verse 16 and 17 here in our text, if you look there again with me, in Isaiah 33, we see here some privileges that we get to enjoy, some blessings that we get to partake in. It says there, we he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him as water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king and his beauty. They shall behold the land that is afar off. Just four things tonight. Four privileges of a Christian. And by the way, we're talking about the work of Christ. We're talking about uh, doing what God made us to do, being what God made us to be. We're talking about fulfilling the purpose that God has for me and for you here on this earth. And we need to understand the privileges that we have. Number one, I want you to notice the privilege of our position. The privilege of our position, your position in Christ. Notice in verse 16, He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of the rocks. Now, now what does it mean that we'll dwell on high? Now, obviously, as a believer, my eternal home, now my temporary home is Edmonton, but my eternal home is not here. I'm not an eternal citizen of Alberta or Canada or the city of Edmonton. I'm an eternal citizen of heaven. And I, I'm on my way to my eternal citizenship, to my place on high with him. But I believe it speaks more than just about my eternity here. I believe it speaks uh, a little more that we're placed in a wonderful position. Look at Ephesians. Hold your place here. And I'll have you turn there with me, the book of Ephesians. And I'll give you a couple other verses to write down in a moment, but go ahead and turn to Ephesians with me. I want you to see this this evening. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 6. And this, this verse is so illustrative of our position in Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us set together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I want you to understand this, this evening, Christians, that we are placed. We are lifted up in a high place. We're, we're set together in heavenly places, the Bible tells us. We're raised up by Him. Once, before you came to Christ, you were in Adam. You were in sin. Forty years ago this month, four decades ago this very month, I bowed my knees in a little trailer, a little camper in Gillette, Wyoming, and I called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save my soul. I was born again. I accepted that free gift of eternal life. I went from being in Adam to being in Christ. I was lifted up into a heavenly place. Write these verses down, if you will. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a verse probably most of you have memorized, tells us we're new creatures. And then Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, as you compare that, if you'll look at that verse and compare those verses later, you'll see the blessing of exactly what God has done as He has lifted us up. As the psalmist said, I remember the pit from whence I was dug. I am, as Ephesians tells me here, I am a heavenly citizen. I am lifted up in a high place. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, if you want to jot that reference down to look up later as well. And how wonderful that is. God, God's made provision for us to dwell. To dwell on high. My position in Christ. My position in Him. Too many Christians 
We live like we're spiritual paupers when we're children of the king. I'm not going to fulfill the purpose God made me for. I'm not going to serve him to the extent that I could. I'm not going to fulfill the, my life's purpose if I live like I have no ability. If I live like I have no means. I'm hardwired if I go somewhere, if I go to a fast food restaurant, I'm hardwired. The first thing I do when I get in a fast food restaurant, I look at the value menu. That, that's the way I'm hardwired. Uh, as a kid growing up, we rarely ever went to, uh, out to eat or for fast food, but if we did, it was, okay, you can pick what you want off of that menu right there. Not, the other people, they can order there, but you order right here. I'm the same way now. Uh, I go, I look at the, we used to be the dollar menu. How many of you remember back 50 years ago almost when we had a dollar menu? Uh, now it's a dollar ninety nine or two forty nine or uh, $3,000, something like that. And, you, know, you order off of that menu. I remember we, I went out with a millionaire. We went to a restaurant called Steak and Shake. Anybody ever been to Steak and Shake in the U.S.? I've been there one time. I was there with a millionaire. It's not an expensive place. It's just a place I'd never been. And uh, were you there for that? Did you go to Steak and Shake? You were pregnant with. You were home with, uh, getting ready to deliver. I think maybe. Uh, I was traveled to a church when Carrie was pregnant with Hannah, Elizabeth, one of our kids. I don't remember. I don't know how many kids I have anymore. I get confused. But after church, we were the fellow. He's a wonderful, wonderful Christian. Was there to. Uh, conference that I was at, and he took all the missionaries and pastors out for a meal, and we got to steak and shake. And before we went inside, he stopped us at the door. And he was paying for everything. His name is Tom Raper. And uh, Tom Raper had a very successful, uh, and when I say very successful, the most successful RV business in North America. Uh, his, his company, Tom Raper RV, had the highest name recognition of any business on the eastern side of the United States. When he sold the business, he also sold the name because it was that recognizable. He had retired and sold his business, and, but he was there, and he actually shared the gospel at the church that Sunday, did a powerful job of sharing Christ. And, but as we're going in the restaurant, he stopped us as we went in. He looked at us, every person, and he said, every one of you are going to have, and he told us, you're going to have this, you're going to have a milkshake. You're going to have, he, he made sure you're going to order this, this, and this. You know why he had to say that? Because he knew people like me would go in and go, yeah, I'll have the, the $3, and their $3 hamburger would be a cheap burger. I'll have the $3 burger. He said, you're ordering, you're getting the full meal deal. He said, every, I don't care if you eat it or not. I'm ordering it for everybody. Everybody's getting the best they have. He wanted us to have the best. Now, if you had, you know, a couple loonies in your pocket, and you're walking down the street and you're hungry. You know, maybe you go to McDonald's. What can I get for $2? But if you have a million dollars in your pocket, you probably don't go to McDonald's and go, okay, I guess I'll have, uh, I'll have one McDouble. You, you probably get a little more. I don't know, but I guess you probably would. The Christians, when we look at our life and forget the privileges that we have, we forget the position we have in Christ. We limit what God wants to do because we fail to see God's provision for us. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, but we see our position, our position in Christ. First uh, John 3.1, if you want to write that reference down, First John 3.1 and Romans 8.17, we see that our position, uh, that we are joint heirs, joint heirs uh, with Christ. And how powerful that is. Uh, I, I'm on my way to the palace of the king. I'm joint heirs with Christ. Uh, God wants us to travel first class. I've never traveled first class before. I've never traveled business class. I always travel the last class before you live in a box underneath the airplane. But God wants us to travel first class as Christians. He wants us to realize our position in Him. Why? Because He has a big job, a big work for us to do. He has a big plan for your life and for my life. Number two, look at verse 16. He shall dwell on high His place of defense. 
And defense, that's, that's not the way you say defense. Uh, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Number two, I want you to see another privilege we have in Christ. Now, we look at these privileges because it puts us in a place where we are, have the ability to do what God has for us. Number one, we have our position. I'm, I'm lifted up. I'm elevated in Him. I'm in the heavenly places. I, I'm a joint heir with Christ. Number two, I have protection. Protection in Christ. I am in a place of defense. A place of defense. I can trust the Lord because God is the one who takes care of me. He's my protection. Colossians 3.3, if you want to write that reference down, speaks uh, of the protection we have in God. Uh, Psalm 91, verse number 1, again we see a picture of God, our protector, uh, the one who guards us, the one who protects us, the one who keeps us in His place. Psalm 23, the Bible speaks of the shepherd's psalm, that he walks with me, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Why, why would that rod and that staff comfort me? That rod and that staff is a picture of protection, a picture of that which is able to protect and to guard and, and take care of me. The other day I was walking in the bush and I saw some grizzly bear tracks. More than a few. I was glad that I had my little friend with me. Uh, my little friend, the seven millimeter. Uh, I was glad it was in my hand. Uh, I had some protection. Christian, I've got protection from God. I'm protected. I am covered by Him. I, there's nothing. Get this thought here. There is nothing that can happen to you that God does not allow. Now process that thought for a minute. Nothing. The devil came to God and said, God, I would like permission to touch the life of Job. Why did the devil ask permission? Because he had to. Because he knew that God protected Job. The safest place that you could ever be is in the center of God's will. The safest place. Yesterday, Elizabeth did what she will probably do every Saturday while she's in Bible college. She went to the inner city of Chicago sharing the gospel. They go, oh, Chicago, that's a scary place. It's a dangerous place. And it is. A lot of murders in Chicago, a lot of crime in Chicago, a lot of gangs in Chicago. But can I tell you that if she's there in God's will and God's purpose, that's the safest place she could ever be. Christian, when we begin to realize that when we are serving Christ, I've got His protection. God's not going to let anything happen that He doesn't allow. And by the way, God has a purpose. That doesn't mean that I always understand it. That doesn't mean that everything that happens, boy, that's such a, uh, that's a good thing. By the way, some bad things happen, but it's, God allows it for His purpose, for His glory. This whole idea, uh, the health and wealth philosophy gospel preached by the heretics on uh, TV and radio and Internet today, you don't find that in the Word of God. But you do find that God has a purpose. God has a plan, and God allows everything for His purpose. We see His protection. I, I'm not free from trouble. You're not going to be free from trials. We don't see that in Scripture. By the way, I'm, I'm not free from death. One day, if the Lord tarries is coming, you're going to find out that I'm dead. My expiration date's going to come up. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I'm going to be gone. I'm not free from that, but I am protected, protected by Him. This body, it's just my earthly house. Once it's destroyed, that's okay. I'm going to live somewhere else forever. It's just temporary. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. If you look at that passage later, you see that it's a whole lot better to be there than it is to be here. But I have God's protection. An old hymn, really, really old hymn. I don't believe it's in our book. A phrase in that hymn is, Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone. And our defense is sure. Christian, I have a God who protects me. I have the privilege of being in a position with Christ. I have the protection of having my God putting me in a place of defense, a place of guardedness, a place where I can serve Him. I can know that God is with me. David walked down in that valley and he said, well, I'm so big and I'm so strong, I'm going to beat up Goliath. That's not what he said. He walked down in that valley and he said, today, God. Not today, I. He said, today, God will deliver you into my hand. David didn't walk down there alone. David walked down there without Saul's armor. He walked down without Saul's sword. But he did not walk down without protection. He had the God of heaven. Number one, I have the privilege of position in Christ. Number two, I have the protection of Christ. Look at verse 16 again with me. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be... The munitions of rocks. And by the way, I didn't touch on this, but God says, I'm going to put you in a safe place and I'm going to gift you lots of ammunition. There's going to be rocks all around. You need to hurl some rocks at the, uh, the devil. They're there. Can I tell you that I got them right here? I've got his word, which is powerful and quick. But look at the next part of that verse in verse 16. Bread shall be given him. Bread shall be given him and his water shall be sure. I want you to see the provision that's in Christ. You know, we often think that I, I can't serve the Lord. I, I, can't, I can't do anything. I, 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 have, no, I have no potential. I, I, I have no means. I have no ability. When God tells us as believers, I'm going to take care of you. I, I, I'm going to provide for you. I, I'm going to meet all your needs. And we see here that provision. It tells us about bread that shall be given, waters that shall be sure. Can I tell you, Christian, that God sustains you? God gives us His bread, the bread of life. God gives us the water of the Spirit. God sustains you. God meets your need, Christian, for your growth. God physically provides for us. I mentioned Psalm 23, Psalm 23, 1. The Bible tells us of the beginning of God's provision. The great shepherd psalm. Psalm 34, if you want to write this reference down, Psalm 34, verse 10, Philippians 4, 19. I love that passage in Philippians, and I, and I hope you know it. And If not, study and look and see that God wants to supply your need. He can supply my need. He provides for us. Psalm 37, 25, 1 Kings 17, 25. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture Passage after passage after passage, we see that God provides for the needs of His people. Look at Ephesians 1.3 with me. Back in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1 and verse 3. We see a wonderful verse here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, notice this, with all spiritual blessings 
in heavenly places in Christ. I love that. With all heavenly blessings. When I was young, when I was dating, actually my wife, Carrie and I were, I think we were engaged or we were at least dating. <clears throat> we used to get to have lunch together at college. Must have been, maybe we were engaged, I don't remember. I worked a crazy schedule for a while and didn't see her much, but Back when we were, the last time before we got married when we were dating and we could have lunch together at the college, the finances at the college, it was obvious we're getting a little bit tight. And you can tell that in a, in a Bible college when the finances are getting tight by what food they serve you in the dining hall. And I remember we'd go there and food was getting not quite so good. And... The Lord took care of us, took care of the college, took care of us students, had a big semi, a full uh, box trailer full of potatoes. The semi broke down. They couldn't transport the potatoes. I don't know why or how, but they gave the entire semi load of potatoes to the college. My wife will tell you this is true. We had potato everything. We'd come in. The main course was a baked potato. We'd have fried potatoes, baked potatoes, roasted potatoes. Uh, it was like the Irish famine. Uh, oh, we ate potato and potato and potato. And you know what? I still love potatoes. Praise God. Uh, but we, we were provided for. But so often, we think that God says, okay, yeah, maybe I got some potatoes for you. I don't, I, I don't have much, but I'll give you a potato. God provides for us with the best. Christian, God meets our spiritual needs with the best. Not just a hopefully we get by, but God's provision is a perfect provision. And when we realize that I can trust Him. The Bible says there in Ephesians, talks about His provision there. We see it again in Colossians. and I, We won't take time to turn there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. We, we see God's provision for us. Look at John with me. John chapter 6. The Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 35. As we, I want us to, to think about and see this, the fact that God does provide. And that's a privilege I have as a Christian I, I can serve Him and fulfill the purpose God has for me. Why? Because God provides the means for that to happen. John 6, verse number 35. The Bible tells us there, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus told the woman at the well, Sychar's well. He said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask a drink of me. And I would give you water that you'd never thirst again. And the woman said, how is it that you have this water? You have nothing to, 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 to dip the water with. You see, she didn't understand yet. He was talking about himself. Christian, I have living water. If you're born again tonight, you have eternal living water. And God says you'll never thirst again. He meets the needs of our heart. He meets our spiritual need. And by the way, he provides physically. The Bible says I've never seen the righteous begging bread as God provides for our needs and meets our needs, sometimes with potatoes. But God meets our needs. God provides for us. I'm going to give you seven things if you want to write these down tonight as we talk about our provision. God provides you, Christian, with a life that can never be forfeited. A life that can never be forfeited. A life that you can never lose. Eternal life. John 10, 28, we see that. Not only, number one, a life that can never be forfeited. Number two, uh, God gives us a relationship that can never be broken. We live in a world of broken relationships. I don't know all your backgrounds in here this, 
tonight. But even in a crowd this side tonight, I'm sure that many of you would, if you spoke about your life, maybe your early life, maybe your family life, many would say, I come from a broken relationship, maybe a broken home. Uh, maybe you've got some scarred past from some broken relationships. Almost all of us are touched by broken relationships in our world. But I have the privilege of the provision of a relationship that can never be cut off, never severed. I'm eternally His. We see that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Not only that relationship that can never be severed, but number three, I have a righteousness that can never be tarnished. I've got a ring. Well, I've got this. Get it off here, maybe. Where's that axe, Milton? I might cut this off. My wedding band lives on my finger. If you, it almost looks like I have a ring on when I don't. But I, I wear this ring all the time. I don't take it off for anything unless I'm showing you my groove. But I've got another ring at home that was in a box of jewelry that well, my grandmother passed away. And to the best of my knowledge, I'm pretty sure my grandfather got it in World War II. It was made from a, a silver coin. And it's a pretty neat ring. You can see uh, the inside. Uh, you can see the writing around the edge of the coin. And I can't remember the, type, the name of the coin. Uh, you can see the year on there. But it was probably made... Uh, uh, it's a piece of trench art, if you will. Some of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. Soldiers that were uh, sitting around in quarantine like I was for two weeks, you know, in the foxholes and, and waiting. Uh, many of them made different things while they were in, in war. Uh, some, some pretty cool trench art from the era. And I believe that ring, I don't think my grandfather made it. My grandfather probably traded for it uh, from one of his buddies uh, in World War II when he was there. But I got that ring, it was, uh, it's in my drawer, I think, by my chair. And I've worn it a couple times, but when I wear it, it turns my finger black. And so I, I, I leave it in my drawer, otherwise I've got a black ring around my finger. Uh, it, 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 it reacts with my skin, it, it turns dark. You know, the fact is, a lot of us, we try to shine up our own life. Before you got saved, you try to clean up your act, you try to turn over a new leaf, and you try to make yourself look really good. And what happens? <laughs> it tarnishes pretty quick. I bought one new vehicle in my life, 1995 Ford Ranger XLT. I'll never buy another new vehicle. <laughs> but I bought one about a month after I bought it. I crashed it. Didn't ruin it. Just damaged it. It got fixed. But it wasn't new anymore after that. Now, it looked new. It got fixed. But after that, I didn't care what happened to it. Because it wasn't new anymore. Best thing that ever happened to that vehicle. But Christian, we, we try to make ourselves look good. and We shine ourselves up, but we tarnish pretty fast. But God gives us a righteousness which is never going to be tarnished. I have the righteousness of Christ. You have the righteousness of Christ. We see that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, if you want to write that reference down. Let me give you four more points, and then let me share the last thought with you here. Number four, when we think about God's provision for us, the privileges we have in Christ, God gives us a peace that can never be destroyed. A peace that can never be destroyed. We see that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. God speaks peace to your heart and to my heart, Christian. And that peace, oh, all around us, the waves may be raging. All around us, the waves may be boisterous, the wind boisterous, but I can have that inner peace. Never destroyed. 
Number next, number five. What else does God give us in provision? God gives us an acceptance. By the way, I gave you Ephesians 1.6, Ephesians 2.14 for the last one instead of Ephesians 1.6. Number five, though, God gives us an acceptance which can never be questioned. I'll share a quick funny story. My daughter Elizabeth took a test, an English placement test, the other day, and she passed. For the reason she must take after her mother, not after her father. And she passed so she could go into the next level of English in college instead of the first level. She told me she went to that first class. She told her mother, she said, I don't know how I passed that test. I don't belong in this class. And she decided she changed. She started the first one. She said, I'm not, I don't think I'm ready for that. Uh, she's taken the first year instead of the second year. Uh, she was allowed to go ahead, but she didn't want to. She said, I'm not, not quite ready for that. She said, I don't know if I really I'm a, I should be in that class. Christians, so oftentimes we think, I, I don't think God really accepts me. A lot of Christians struggle with this, this principle. And I want you to write down Ephesians 1, 6, the verse I gave you earlier is for this one. Realize that you are accepted in Christ. God doesn't say every day, okay, I wonder if I'm going to accept Joel today. Mm, okay, today. I'll think about it again tomorrow. God doesn't do that. God, God doesn't look at Terry and go, okay, let me see. Am I going to accept? Nah, maybe not today. I'm accepted. I don't, I don't have to fight for God accept, God's acceptance. I don't have to wonder what God thinks about me. I, I have an acceptance that God never, you may question, God never questions. And that's a powerful thing that God gives us. Number next, quickly, I have an inheritance. I have an inheritance that can never fade. 1 Peter 1.4, my inheritance in Christ, which will never fade. Uh, number seven, I have a title. Look at Revelation 1 with me. Revelation chapter 1. We'll look at this verse, and I want to share just one more quick thought with you. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. And hath made us kings... And priest unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a title God has given you. And God has given me, not disputed. Let me challenge you to do this as you look at the verses I gave you as you study. As you go through the book of Ephesians and the other epistles, in the New Testament, look for the words in Christ, in Him. You'll see that over and over. You are in Him. I am in Christ. I, I've got that provision. Uh, look at Obadiah 17. Don't turn there now, but... Write down that reference, Obadiah 17, Isaiah 55, verse 2. Look at those verses and see the power of God's provision. Lastly, as we look back in our text, if you'll turn back there quickly, back in our text in Isaiah, we see one last thing. Isaiah chapter 33. And look in verse 17. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Christian, what's your prospect? Can I tell you that I have a wonderful prospect in Christ? The Bible tells me there, Thine eyes shall see. Thine eyes shall see the king. The Bible says that I'll see His beauty, that I'll behold the land far off. That's a wonderful prospect. One more reference I want to ask you to write down, Job 19. Job 19, verses 25 through 27. 
The prospect we see here in Isaiah is a twofold prospect. Twofold, two parts, if you will. I'm going to see the place. One day I'm going to see heaven. That place that John saw that God gave him to pen the words. A place with walls of jasper, a place with gates of pearl, a place with uh, streets of gold, a place... Beautiful place, wonderful place, a place where no sin enters in. A place where there's no need of the sun because the S-O-N is the light thereof, not the S-U-N. I'm going to see that place, and that's going to be an amazing thing. But I'm not just going to see the place. I'm going to see the person. I'm going to see the person of Christ. And the Bible tells us when I see him. I will be like him, for I shall see him as he is. As we talk about doing the work of God, fulfilling the purpose for God made, that God made you for, we need to realize the privileges we have. We need to realize the position that we are in, that we have a, an opportunity, a prospect so wonderful that we can do what God wants us to do. I believe that God can use you and God can use me. I believe God wants to do mighty things through your life. But if we don't believe what God says, we're going to doubt what He wants to do. As we see the privileges we have, it frees us from the bondage that we put ourselves in. As we try to think that Oh, I don't know, I, I, I'm, my hands are tied because I don't know, I just can't. No, your hands aren't tied. You're free in Christ. I, I, I have so much that God has given me. And one day I'm going to see him. First John 3, 2 tells us that when I see him. Christian, I want you to think about this week. What you would wish how you would wish you had lived, what you would wish you had done, what decisions you wish you had made if you saw him right now. One day we're going to see him. When we think about the provision, we think about the prospect of one day standing face to face. Can I tell you it causes us to want to be busy now to want to have a relationship with him now and out of that relationship let God use us and work through us to do the great work that God has for you and God has for me let's pray together tonight Lord help us as believers to believe your word Lord we call ourselves Bible believers but Lord so often we are Bible doubters God, help us to just believe what your word says is true. Lord, we see some wonderful privileges that we have. How tremendous. And Lord, when we get our mind and our heart wrapped around all that we have, it puts us in a position to realize that we can obey. We can find the purpose. We can fulfill the purpose wherewith you made us. Lord, you've got a great plan for every person in this room. Lord, if we were honest with you, many of us would have to confess, if not all of us, that so often we doubt that we can do anything useful. So often we question whether or not you really have a plan. So often, Lord, we doubt that there's anything, any work, any beneficial thing that we could do for your service and for your work. Lord, help us to stop listening to those lies of the devil. God, help us to realize that you do have a purpose. And Lord, you want to meet our needs and you want to use us mightily. Lord, I pray tonight that we take some time during this time of invitation. Lord, to be thankful, to 
praise you. And Lord, to commit ourselves afresh and anew to your purpose for our life. With our heads bowed, and eyes closed, would you stand with me? If we pause for just a moment this evening with our heads bowed and eyes closed as you stand together with me. The altar's open tonight, no music this evening, but with no one looking around tonight, the altar's open. If you need to do business with God, maybe tonight you just need to pause and just thank the Lord for the great privilege you have of being a child of God. Thank the Lord for that day that you called upon Him. Thank the Lord for that person that shared Christ with you. And by the way, as you do so, would you realize that God wants you to share Christ with others? We say, oh, pastor, I could never do that. Would you tonight say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Lord, I'm going to trust your provision. I'm going to trust your leading, your power. And God, would you use me? God, would you help me to be a tool in your hands? Lord, to, be, to affect the cause of Christ and eternity for those around me. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be encouraged together in your word. And Lord, how powerful the privileges that we have in Christ. Lord, I don't deserve and we don't deserve any of them. But by your grace, we have them. Lord, I pray as we, as we study together, as we look in the word of God together, that we will be encouraged. Lord, I pray that you would kindle a fire inside of us. Lord, I pray that we would burn brightly. I pray that we would have a desire to be used. I pray that as a church that we would have a desire to be cohesive. I pray we would have a desire to be effective. And Lord, I pray that we would have a desire most of all to please you, our Savior, to obey you, to honor you, and to lift you up. And Lord, you promise that if you be lifted up, you draw all men to yourself. God, help us simply to lift up Jesus. Lord, bless us tonight. Lord, I pray you dismiss us with your grace. Lord, may you be glorified for our gathering tonight. May you meet the need of every person. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.